Thanks for stopping by the channel today. My name is Jason. I'm KC5HWB. This is the extra class. This is the final class in the three classes of amateur radio licensing that exist in the United States today. Some of my most popular videos on this channel have been the technician class and the general class, which is class one and class two, or level one and level two, if you will. This is level three. This is the final level. This is the top license you can get. And I want to thank the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club for allowing me to record this Zoom class they did at the uh, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. It was about eight, six to seven hour sessions, so you're in for a wild ride today. <laughs> uh, go through them as many times as you want to. Uh, fast forward, stop, pause, rewind, whatever you want to do. Play them over and over again. This is good information for those of you who are currently a general and wanting to upgrade to Amateur Extra. Thank you to the North Richland Hills Amateur Radio Club. Their website will be linked in the description of the video below, and I hope you enjoy the video series. You see the picture of the pickup truck? This is my old pickup truck with the HF vertical on the back end of it. Looks like a really good drawing there, sir. <laughs> You're so kind. Okay, so everybody sees the pickup truck with the mobile mounted vertical. That is emulating this quarter wave vertical ground mounted with radials and coax coming off of the bottom of the vertical. I built one of those one time using copper tubing, like quarter, three-eighths inch, probably three-eighths inch copper tubing for the vertical, antenna vertical on 20 meters with about 20 radio wires. That worked out really well. Unfortunately, I had to take it down when I had to start mowing the grass again in the backyard. So that's where it goes. But the whole point of this picture is same resonant frequency, how can it be like maybe eight feet or nine feet on the back of your truck or car or vehicle or whatever it is you have it hooked to? It's because you have this inductive loading coil right in the middle of it. The inductive loading coil cancels out the capacitive reactance of a short antenna. Antennas shorter than a quarter wave have capacitive reactance. Uh, other points on this, you can increase the effect of radiated power, meaning higher efficiency. You're getting more power radiated as electromagnetic waves if you use a capacity hat. I've seen ads recently, uh, I think it was in one of the radio magazines. I don't remember which one exactly for a capacity hat. So they want to sell you a capacity hat to put on top of your buddy pole, on top of your mobile antenna. Now that's going to detune it a little bit, so you might have to change the tuning on it. But it, what it does, it puts more capacitance here at the top, so you get more radiated power from your antenna, which is a good thing. Um, when you put, when you cancel out this capacitive reactance in the short antenna with this inductance, it increases the Q. Higher Q decreases the bandwidth. I mean, that's the trade off for having a short antenna. You decrease the bandwidth, but it still resonates at the same frequency as a quarter wavelength long antenna. The radiation resistance goes down, which is bad. The capacitive reactance goes up when the frequency decreases. And those are all undesirable things, but that's the trade offs you get when you have these short and quarter wave resonators and compensate for the capacitive reactance with a choke up here. And the best place to put this choke is in the middle of the vertical antenna. A lot of these mobile verticals put the, the coil inductance down here at the bottom. That's not the best place for the best efficiency. It needs to be up here in the middle of the radiator. 
and hope it doesn't weigh down the back of the truck like looks like this one's doing. Um, this is just a reminder that the Q of the coil is related to the resistance in the coil. The lower the resistance, the higher the Q. Uh, unfortunately, this resistance is a loss. It loses power. So you want the coil resistance to be as low as you can get to decrease the losses in this antenna system because by decreasing the losses using a capacity hat uh, it makes a pretty good mobile antenna. I've run some of these mobile. I never had a capacity hat. I tried one one time but uh, then I drove under a tree and it tore it up. It wasn't strong enough. It was made out of 12 gauge wire. I guess I should have used six gauge wire for the capacity hat. But then that would just would have torn off the branches of the tree and the neighbors would be upset, probably torn my antenna off my car. It was on my car at the time and uh, have all kinds of problems. So those need to be sturdy. What happens as the Q of an antenna increases? The bandwidth decreases. Now, why is it called an SWR bandwidth? See, it describes it as SWR bandwidth. What does that mean? That means the bandwidth between specific SWR measurements. Uh, like lots of transmitters would like the SWR to be below two to one. Uh, if you increase the Q of an antenna with the, the loading coil, which it does, it increases the Q, the bandwidth between the 2.0 SWR points decreases. So it decreases the bandwidth that you can work without retuning the antenna. Now, if you have an automatic tuner in your radio, that's great. I love the one in this radio that I got here a year or so ago. And if, the, if I don't have the antenna tuner tuned just right for my little short vertical wire outside the window, uh, it, it matches the transmitter to the whatever odd impedance that is and I just transmit merrily along. Yeah, I lose a little bit of efficiency, but that's okay. I was running FT8 and so that can stand uh, less efficient antenna. So Q of an antenna increases and the SWR bandwidth decreases. What is the function of the loading coil in the HF mobile antenna? What was the loading coil doing? It cancels capacitive reactance because inductive reactance always cancels capacitive reactance. So the loading coil is an inductor. What is antenna bandwidth? Uh, is this any different than SWR bandwidth? Well, let's see, what does B say? The frequency range over which an antenna satisfies a performance requirement. Well, the, performance requ the first performance requirement is it, it resonates. Well, that's not bandwidth, that's the resonant frequency. The frequency range over which the antenna has an SWR below two is a performance requirement. So that becomes the SWR bandwidth. SWR below two is a performance requirement and that's what the antenna bandwidth is. What happens to the SWR bandwidth when one or more loading coils are used to resonate an electrically short antenna? What do we say happens to the bandwidth? It decreases and yes, it does. Uh, if you get one of those uh, early on, when was that, when did that be? Early 1980s to mid 1980s, when I had a radio that I took mobile and had some Cushcraft uh, center loaded antennas with the, the uh, loading coil up in the center of it. They worked great, but on 40 meters, you got like 30 kilohertz bandwidth on 80 meters, you got about 10 kilohertz bandwidth of what the uh, transmitter would load into. 
So it really decreases the SWR bandwidth when you, you use the loading coils for that short of a antenna. Why should an HF mobile antenna loading coil have a high ratio of reactance to resistance? Well, the ratio of reactance to resistance is the Q. I could have put that on there, but that's not what was in the book. This is, this is the question. Why should an HF mobile loading coil have a high ratio of reactance to resistance, which means Q, that minimizes the losses? You want to minimize the loss. So that's what the loading coil with the high Q does, minimizes the loss. Any antenna system, you want to minimize losses. Where should a high Q loading coil be placed to minimize losses? Where did we say was the best place? Near the center. Put it up in the center. That's the best place um, people debate for a long time about where that is. And eventually somebody did a study and said, put it in the middle. That's the, the best place to minimize the loss and get the most uh, radiation from it, radiated power from it. What's an advantage of using top loading in a shortened HF vertical antenna? That's the capacity hat. What's the advantage of doing that? You improve the radiation efficiency, which means you increase the amount of electromagnetic energy radiated from that antenna, which is the whole point of having antenna, to get as much RF energy radiated out What happens to feed point impedance at the base of a fixed length HF mobile antenna when it's below its resonant frequency? If it's below its resonant frequency, the radiation resistance decreases and capacitive reactance increases. Okay, so what's that saying? Oops, I missed part of the, this part. What's that really saying? Is that if you've got a uh, six foot long vertical on the back of your truck, if it's not loaded, it's going to resonate. Let's see, six feet is about two meters, so that's a quarter, so that's about eight meters. So it's going to resonate about eight meters which is just a little bit shorter than 10. So that's a little bit, yeah. So see, that's uh, closer, that's below, uh, close to 40 meter band. No, it's not, eight meters. Eight meter total wavelength, quarter wave is two meters, which is six feet. Uh, six meters is at 50 megahertz. Eight meters would be 40 megahertz range. So we're going to operate it at seven megahertz. So the radiation resistance is very low. The capacitive reactance is very high. So it needs that loading coil up in the middle of it to make it resonate at seven megahertz on 40 meters. Now, 40 meters was about my favorite band to operate mobile. I guess that's because it radiated well. There were lots of people on 40 meters. Uh, it just seemed to, to be the best band. I tried 20, but it was hard for that inefficient of an antenna to work with uh, the 20 meter beams that were 100 feet in the air. 40 meters is a lot more competitive and compatible with wire antennas when it's a 40 meter mobile antenna. See, there's, there's that practical point of mobile antennas too. That's not on the test, that's just my experience. So the feed point impedance at the base 
of the mobile antenna decreases, radiation resistance goes down, which is not good, and the capacitive reactance increases, which needs a loading coil, which causes its own losses. What usually occurs if a Yagi antenna is designed for maximum forward gain. Uh, you can design your own Yagi antenna. It's in the antenna handbook. Um, the front to back ratio decreases. You remember in the azimuth pattern that we talked about for that Yagi antenna in the drawing? That would, if you design it solely for maximum forward gain, that back lobe is gonna grow. So what you do, you decrease the forward gain a little bit and make the back lobe decrease more. So it's a trade-off. <clears throat> you have to uh, give up a little bit of forward gain to decrease the uh, back gain. The, the back lobe gain. What is the far field of an antenna? Uh, you might have heard that term, the, the antenna's far field. It's the region where the shape of the antenna pattern is independent of distance. Now, that's hard to determine because antennas are, are different links and their different frequencies. Uh, it's usually given in wavelengths. Usually the two to three wavelength range is the far field of an antenna. That's out of the immediate field of an antenna. Inside immediate fields of antenna, the pattern is not the same as it is mm -hmm. in the far field. So you want the, the antenna pattern to be the same whether you're five miles out or a hundred miles out, but it's gonna take you a while to, to measure the antenna pattern, if, even if you're five miles away from the antenna. So you want to be far enough from the antenna to be in the far field. So the, the pattern that you're gonna draw is the same no matter how far you move from the antenna. If you're closer than the far field, it's not the same antenna pattern. But, uh, uh, but farther than the far field, it's the antenna pattern is the same shape. Okay, here, what type of computer program technique is commonly used for modeling antennas? It's called the method of moments used to model antennas. Computer program, and the way it works is you break up antenna elements into little sections. And you need to use more than 10 segments per half wavelength to get the accurate feed point impedance. The modeling program is going to draw you the uh, azimuth and elevation propagation pattern. It'll give you the feed point impedance. And from that, you can, you can change the frequency and get the shape of the uh, feed point impedance, compare that to 50 ohms, and you've got the SWR at the feed point. But if you don't use more than 10 segments for a half wavelength, and what I've got drawn here is a dipole broken up into segments. So each of the little segments is one little piece of antenna, each having its own current assigned to it. And that's what the method of moments does. It breaks up the antenna elements into little pieces and then calculates all the currents as the antenna radiates. It's a, a method of modeling and designing antennas uh, for when you want to get to do that. And it's, it's very easy to use. For, well, for somebody that's, that's experienced at it, it might take you a while to learn it, but once you do and get the hang of it, it's pretty neat. It's really neat to use. So what's the principle of, of the method of moments? Uh, a wire is modeled as a series of segments, each having its own current. They call it a uniform value of current 
but each little segment is a piece of wire, so it has to have the same current in each segment. The method of moments models an antenna as a series of segments. Uh, each with the uniform value of current. Method of moments works on current segments. What is the disadvantage of decreasing the number of wire segments in an antenna below 10? The disadvantage of having less than 10 segments is what? The feed point impedance may be incorrect. And so see what you can do is <clears throat> You can change the length of each of those segments to change the length of your antenna elements. Like if you're doing a Yagi design and changing the length of all the antenna elements in a Yagi changes the feed point impedance. But if you use less than 10 segments for the half wavelength, the impedance calculation won't be accurate. And so you'll, you'll change the lengths of the elements to get what you want to be 50 ohms but if there's not enough segments, then that 50 ohms is not an accurate calculation. So you'll want to, to make sure you get an accurate calculation of the feed point impedance. So the element links and element spacing uh, is going to be realized when you put this together with aluminum uh, tubing. When constructing a beverage antenna, which of the following factors should be included? in the design to achieve good performance. Constructing a beverage antenna. Uh, it should be one or more wavelengths long. It's on the road to being a long wire antenna. The beverage is one or more wavelengths is what that is. For years and years, I never did know what a beverage antenna was. I thought it was one made out of old Coke cans or something. Uh, that would that would be hard to do and not very practical. It's just a long wire antenna, more than one wavelength. What is a pennant antenna? A pennant antenna looks kind of like the sketch down here. Fed at one corner for vertical polarization. If you feed a, a triangular shaped piece of wire, uh, at one corner and, and the corner is at the bottom, then it's going to be vertically polarized. If you were to lay this, the triangle over a bit and feed it here at the bottom of the center wire, it's going to be horizontally polarized. Now these arrows are strings or ropes that go to supporting elements. Like if you had a tall tower, you could tie this to the top of the tower. It doesn't have to be straight vertical, it can go over at an angle. And then this might, to, to make the triangle, might go over to a house or some other antenna support you've got. I mean, just look around. There's things sticking up off the ground you can tie strings and ropes to. Um, I've had lots of fun making antennas like that once I figured out, you know, it doesn't take much. Uh, usually this, the loop is one wavelength long at whatever your frequency you're trying to focus on. Uh, this can be ladder line. It's going to be a high impedance antenna. Uh, this set about 900 ohms. And so a pennant antenna is a vertically oriented receiving antenna, triangular loop, terminated about 900 ohms. Looks like a pennant in case your uh, baseball team wins the World Series one of these days, which... Uh, I have hopes for the Texas Rangers, but maybe not this year. This year is a big question mark. Pennant antenna looks like a baseball pennant, sort of 900 ohms, high impedance. How can the output voltage of a multiple turn receiving antenna be increased? Well, output voltage of an antenna means how much is it picking up from the radio energy passing by it? Multiple turn receiving loop. You can use multiple turns for a receiving antenna. How can you increase the amount of energy that it collects? You increase the number of turns or the area of the loop. 
like for the pennant antenna, if you made this like, uh, even make it out of ladder line and, and so hook the two sides of the ladder line of the triangle together here, you've got a two turn antenna. It's gonna have more output than just a single wire. Uh, if you manage to get three or four or six turns of wire up here for the pennant, it's gonna have a lot more reception of, of energy passing by from the RF than it will with one wire. If you make the area bigger, it's going to pick up more signal. So multiple turn receiving loop to have higher output voltage into your receiver with more turns and bigger area. Here's our friend, the cardioid pattern again. What feature of the cardioid makes it useful for direction finding? Cardioid pattern, you remember, was omnidirectional most of the way with a null in a specific direction. And we, we fed two quarter wave vertical antennas. Uh, see, what was that? 90 degrees out of phase, a quarter wavelength apart and useful for direction finding. Um, what, what makes it useful for direction finding? This very sharp null. So what you would do if you're on a direction finding commonly called a fox hunt, the fox would be the hidden transmitter. And so you use the output of this antenna or whatever antenna you use. I used a um, a tape measure antenna, which was a three element Yagi uh, built for two meters out of a tape measure uh, metal, a metal tape measure cut into sections. And it's convenient because if you use a, I used an old tape measure, it didn't work anymore. It's got the inches printed right on it. So you don't need another ruler to measure it. You just cut it at the right number of inches uh, those are common on the internet. Google search for tape measure Yagi, and you'll see many designs to make yourself a three element fox hunt tape measure antenna. They're really fun to, to do fox hunting with. But this one is two quarter wave verticals. Quarter wave on two meters would be about 19 and a half inches separated by a quarter wave, which is another 19 and a half inches. And you feed one 90 degrees out of phase. 90 degrees at two meters is a specific uh, length of coax. And you arrange it to where you feed the two antennas. One has a longer coax from a T coming off your uh, handy talkie that serves as the RDF receiver and you, you find the general direction, you find the Fox signal using the omnidirectional pattern, and then you null it out, go for a null in the received strength by pointing this, the, the axis of between the two antennas where the Fox is. And, and when you get a null in the direction, the Fox is over here, right in the direction, right uh, off the end of that quarter wavelength apart, quarter wave antennas. That's how you use the sharp null. You null out your receive signal with this cardioid pattern for RDF. What's an advantage of placing a grounded electrostatic shield around a small loop direction finding antenna? We're doing good, okay. Uh, advantage of placing the grounded electrostatic shield. What could that consist of? That might look like the coax on a, uh, that's the shield on the coax around a small loop direction finding antenna. What would be a small loop direction finding antenna? That's the internal conductor of the coax. So why would you build an RDF loop like that? What's the, what's the advantage of doing that? It says it eliminates unbalanced capacitive coupling to the surroundings, which improves the nulls. 
what antenna pattern is this loop going to have? Uh, it's a bi-directional pattern broadside to the plane of the loop. If you lay the loop on the table, it's going to have uh, a lobe of a lobe of uh, reception coming up from the table and going down through the table. It's it's broadside to the loop. And so the nulls are going to be off the ends. When, when you look through this loop and you line up one side to the other, you're looking at a null. Now, a, 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 a disadvantage of doing this is that you've got a null off both directions. You've got a null coming off one side and you've got a null coming off the opposite side. So you're going to have to find a way to, to get around that if you use this for RDF. Ugh. What is the main drawback of a small wire loop antenna for direction finding? So what's the drawback? Did we say it already? Oh yeah, it has a bi-directional pattern. Either bi-directional lobes off the sides or bi-directional nulls off the ends. Yes, it has nulls, um, and it's the bi-directional pattern for a loop antenna is what the problem is. Why is RF attenuation used when doing a direction finding? It's so that as you get closer to the fox, your receiver is not overloaded. Uh, if you get your receiver overloaded, then the nulls aren't uh, as noticeable. They're, the nulls may disappear because if you've got receiver overload, even the amount of energy your antenna's picking up uh, hides the nulls of the, of the antenna pattern. Another problem with doing that with the handy talkie is the radio itself may receive as much energy through its case as it does the antenna. I've got a radio that does that. And after I figured that out, it didn't go in any more fox hunts. It stayed home. I used the, the radio that was better shielded so that the, the signal it's hearing is coming in the antenna port, not into the radio case itself. So you want to avoid Use RF attenuation to prevent receiver overload and hope that all the energy coming into your radio on a Fox hunt is coming in the antenna port, not through the side of the radio. So it reduces the pattern nulls if you don't have attenuation. It's very, it's very really necessary to have an attenuator uh, in, a, in a Fox hunt. So what's the function of a sense antenna? Some RDF antennas have an array and using a sense antenna makes a null in only one direction. It's arranged so that you can use a sense antenna to give you a, a one direction, a unidirectional null so that there's not uh, an ambiguity between which direction the null is. You've only got one, not two. So that's what a sense antenna does on an RDF antenna. Um, here, here's an interesting picture. We got a, a hidden transmitter over here, upper right corner. And we've got a guy walking around. He's, he's finally got close enough. He thinks he's, he's, tracking into the where the antenna's hidden, where, where the transmitter's hidden. This is a technique called RDF triangulation. You're, you're trying to make a triangle. You see this triangle in the upper right hand corner of where the three uh, directions from these antennas cross. This is a triangulation method. You walk around from three or even four different directions finding the direction to the transmitter. Now often there a lot of times the hidden transmitter will throw off reflections from nearby metal surfaces 
uh, such as one fox hunt I was on, the transmitter was hidden inside an abandoned railroad car made out of metal. So it had lots of reflections coming out of it. There was a highway bridge uh, like 50 yards from this railroad car. Bridge was made out of steel. So the RF energy coming out of this transmitter was reflected off the highway bridge. And so it looked like you didn't know where the, the transmitter was. I thought it was under the highway bridge at first. So I'm showing this guy has this cardioid pattern antenna. And he's so he finds the direction to the transmitter by using the null of the cardioid. And he walks around and he walks around from three different angles in the general direction of where he thinks the transmitter is. And he finds out that his three directions all kind of point to this area right in here. And then he, he goes in closer to where the transmitter is, walks around, turns his attenuator up to where it blocks most of the signal, most of the RF coming into his radio. And then he can use his cardioid again to, to further transmit, to further pinpoint the transmitter till he finds it. Looks around, sees a box, maybe has a LED blinking, it's a radio. Says, aha, I found the radio transmitter. If you ever get a chance to do that, that's pretty fun. I mean, it's not communication. Um, it's, it's having fun with the group on fox hunts. Anyway, that's my soapbox. What's the triangulation method of radio direction finding? Uh, what's the answer? Antenna headings from several different receiving locations are used to locate the signal source. That's what I just described in that picture. You have, you have several different receiving locations. You get a, a heading or a bearing on a map. One time I used a map to draw the bearings on and pointed right to where the transmitter was. What's the effect of adding a terminating resistor to a rhombic antenna? See, this is the rhombic antenna. This is the, the drawing right out of the book. I managed to, to get that. Um, no, I can't get this there. Okay, so a rhombic antenna. Man, if you've got a farm with eight or 10 or 20 acres, you can put one of these up. You can't put one of these up on your city lot. You might put one up for two meters, but yeah. That's no good. This is like for uh, HF. It's huge. It's acres big. So what is the terminating resistor on the rhombic antenna do? It changes the radiation pattern from bidirectional to unidirectional. So why would you want to do that? If you've got um, interference coming from one direction or another when you build your rhombic, you would fix it to where you have a relay out here and uh, to switch out the resistor, you can run the wires to the relay underground and they're not gonna affect the pattern of the antenna. You might run them around the perimeter of it, whatever, if they're underground, the antenna and, and RF shouldn't see it. But it, the terminating resistor, which is, the resistor up here between the two poles opposite the feed line will change the radiation pattern from bidirectional to unidirectional. Uh, see next page. This is figure E91. What's figure E91? Figure E91 is called a azimuth radiation pattern. And I made it too big. So what this is, the main lobe is aligned at zero degrees. This is a free space pattern looking down from above. We've seen two or three of these already. But what we're gonna look at is these lines, the, the, the radial lines going out are the directions. The circles surrounding the center are levels, uh, usually in dB, 
If you've got zero dB out here on the outer circle, then the next circle down is 3 dB down, 6 dB down is the next one, 12 dB, and 24 dB down is the center uh, lowest circle where the antenna pattern touches. Now this has a broad main lobe, two little side lobes, and a really broad back lobe. Now, what's the question about this figure? This is one that's in the book. It's figure E91 that will be supplied with this question if you get it. It says, in this pattern shown, what is the beam width? Well, you got to know what beam width is. Beam width is the portion of the antenna radiation pattern that's down 3 dB. Antenna radiation pattern beam width is where you hit minus 3 dB. You put that in there, 3 dB. The question doesn't explain it, but it's probably in the book. Um, so how many degrees, see the answer is gonna be in degrees. It's the angle out here where the antenna crosses 3 dB. Uh, it's gonna be between, let's see, zero, 30 and halfway is 15. So you just kind of have to estimate where the, the antenna pattern crosses the 3 dB line, which is uh, halfway between 15 and 30 would be, uh 22 and a half so that's about 25 degrees so it's 25 degrees positive and it's symmetrical to the other side so the beam width is about 50 degrees is that the right answer b oh good we got it i remembered that's been a while since i've calculated antenna radiation pattern beam widths so the the beam width is how broad is the antenna pattern between the minus three dB points, minus three dB meaning half power. So more than half the power is going out at 50 degrees wide. See there's 25 degrees uh, on the upside and there's 25 degrees on the downside. So this 50 degrees around is 360 degree azimuth is where more than half the power is, is being radiated. And that's what's defined as the beam width. So it's antenna radiation pattern beam width at minus three dB. And in this picture comes out to 50 degrees here and here. So if you've printed off the study sheets, you can take your pencil, draw from the center of the circles right here through the radiation pattern where it crosses 3 dB out going upper right, going lower right at minus 25 degrees. And between this 50 degrees in front of the antenna is where the signal strength is gonna be the greatest. So that's defined as the beam width. Same antenna radiation pattern. What is the front to back ratio? Uh, front to back ratio is defined as the difference in amplitude between the main lobe and the back lobe. Well, what the main lobe is at zero, that's the reference. This is zero degrees. The outer circle is zero dB. They left that off. The outer circle is reference unity gain one at zero dB. So what amplitude is this back lobe? Uh, somewhere between minus 12 and minus 24, maybe halfway. So what's halfway from 12 to 24? It's a difference of 12, half of that is six. Uh, to minus 12 decreased by six is minus 18 down. Is that the answer? 18 dB is the front to back ratio. See how we got that? Can you, do, front, can you, run, can you run that one more time? Okay, it wants to know what is the front to back ratio. The front antenna lobe is the main lobe and that's usually set out here at the reference of zero dB, which is unity gain. So zero dB for the main lobe, 
the amplitude of the back lobe, which is just opposite the main lobe, is on this pattern halfway between minus 12 and minus 24. See this circle represents minus 24 dB. This circle just outside where the back lobe is is minus 12. So it's halfway between minus 12 and minus 24. And so that would come up to be minus 18. So if the main lobe is at zero dB and the back lobe is at minus 18 dB, the difference is 18 dB which means the front lobe energy is 18 dB higher than the back lobe energy. That's the front to back ratio. Thank you. You're welcome, any more questions? Then let's move on. Uh, same radiation pattern. What is the front to side ratio? Uh, same method. He wants to know the front to side lobe ratio now. We've got the front main lobe at zero dB. What's the amplitude of the side lobe? Uh, well, it's, it's higher than the back lobe. The back lobe is 18, minus 18. So 18 is halfway between 24 and 12, which would be right in here somewhere. So it's more than 18, maybe call it 15, 14 or 15. What does it say the number is? Front to side lobe B, 14 dB. Okay, it called it 14. I think I, I would argue for 15, but 14 is the closest number you've got. It's not 12, it's not 24, it's not 18. It's somewhere between 12 and 18, so you pick 14. So you, sometimes on these questions, you just have to estimate because, I mean, this is even enlarged. You're going to get one that's about the size of the, the minus 12 circle. You just have to move. Uh, yes, I went muted. I'm sorry. Okay, somebody talk to me. Unmute your microphone and tell something, me. Something for you to tear apart later. Make sure I can hear you. Yeah, we got you. Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, John. Anybody? Yes, yeah, yes. Here. Yeah. Can you hear us? Hey, John. You got us there, John? Yes, you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Okay, we'll continue. I get a couple or three thumbs up. Okay, let's go. Uh, share. All right. Uh, can somebody tell me what the last thing you remember about this uh, antenna pattern right here we're talking about. What's the last thing? Uh, did you hear the, the front to back ratio question and explanation? Yes. Uh, yeah, we- I'm looking at what I'm sharing. I can't see the screen if people are yes. nodding your heads. Press the space bar and you can unmute your microphone. It's Hugh, yes, you covered that. They may have some questions about it, though. Uh, maybe my audio speaker went out. I think the one we're on was was. Yeah, um, I think the one we were on was was uh, top to bottom or side uh, to side or whatever it was that was supposed to be. Well, okay, let me. Or whatever it was. Okay, somebody give me a thumbs up if we if you heard the front to back ratio. Yes. Did you hear yeah. the front to side ratio explanation? I think I think you were on the side because you, you you were debating on whether it was fourteen or fifteen or whatever. And okay, I think that was the last one we were on. That's where you lost me. Okay. Yeah, that's where we oh. lost you. All right, then we'll start back with that one. The front to side. Yeah, it was uh, it was B O three. BO3, front to side ratio. Okay, what this means is it's the same meaning as the front to back ratio. That is how much bigger is the front radiation off this antenna than it is the side lobes. So let's go back to the antenna pattern and remember that the front lobe, the main lobe is at zero dB reference. The back lobe we found was at minus 18 dB. So the side lobe 
looks to be a little higher than minus 18. See, minus 18 would be halfway between 12 and 24. Uh, I guess if you use the outer edge of this broad line, it could be stretched to 14. Uh, if I like to use the average of the width of the line in my calculations off the of graphs, so I would call that 15. But whatever number you like, uh, it has to be one of the numbers in this list of answers. So the closest number would be 14. See, 18 is where the back lobe is. And so 18 is halfway between 12 and 24. And so it's going to be closer to 12 than 18. It's not 12, it's not 24, it's not 18. So the other answer is 14, which is the correct answer. Sometimes on these questions, you have to use approximate answers because that's all they give you. And I'll have to check on my uh, microphone later. So let's go on to the next question. What is generally true for the low band 160 and 80 meter receiving antennas? Those are called the low bands. What is generally true uh, of all these answers here? Atmospheric noise is so high that gain over a dipole is not important. They must be erected at least a half wavelength to get good directivity. That's gonna be pretty high on these low bands. I mean, half wave on 80 meters is 40, which is 130 feet. I don't, I can't get anything that high. Low loss coax transmission line is essential. No, not at, at 1.8 and four megahertz. Uh, so none of, not all these are correct. So the answer is the atmospheric noise is so high that the gain of the, of the antenna is not important because all that you're gonna do, if you try and pick up more signal, you're gonna pick up more atmospheric noise on these low bands just because the atmosphere is so noisy, in particular during the summer. Now that's why you hear lots of people during the winter making contacts on 160 meters because the atmosphere is quieter in your uh, half of the world, which is in wintertime, which we are in North America right now uh, in February. So in February, it's summer down in Australia. So 160 meters is not a good choice for bands. They wait till uh, July to enjoy the quietness of 160 meters during the winter because Aussies like things upside down that way, I guess. That's why they put their winter in July. Um, next page, what's the front to back ratio of shown in figure E92? Okay, this is a different type of antenna pattern. This is the elevation pattern. This elevation pattern shows from the side. Let me stop for a minute. Uh, does anybody hear me? Show me your picture or? Yeah, or we, can, we can hear you. Comment, you're hearing now. Okay, yeah, great. I can still hear you. Okay, then let's go back to the elevation antenna pattern, which is what this one is. It's showing the antenna patterns from the side. The main lobe would be the lowest one because these, up, these higher lobes off the antenna just go straight up into the ionosphere get absorbed, get passed right straight through the ionosphere, you want the lowest radiation angle in elevation that you can get. See the, the angles here work, this is zero degrees at the bottom, which is parallel to the ground level, is the bottom line. Then there's 15 degrees and 30 degrees and 45 and 60 and 90 degrees is straight up overhead, is how this is constructed. And higher degrees on back to 180 over here on the back end of the antenna. So the forward lobe is usually set at the zero dB. This outer circle is zero dB reference. So there's minus 10 for this circle, then minus 20, then minus 30 and minus 40. So it's asking for the, the front to back, I think is what I remember the question asking. The front lobe is set at zero dB reference. The back lobe is the slowest one to the back. 
which is just a little bit over the line of minus 30 going toward minus 20. So that would be maybe minus 28, minus 29. Uh, it's, it's a little bit over the 30 line, so it's got to be uh, upwards towards 20. And let's see what the, the answer is going to be. What is the front to back ratio of the radiation pattern shown in figure E92? Uh, the answer it says is B is 28. Okay, so it's a little bit less than 30. I mean, it's, it's the same principle as measuring the antenna pattern on the azimuth pattern, only this is the elevation, this is parallel to ground, this is how far it comes up off the ground. So this is looking from the side elevation antenna pattern. Same antenna pattern. What type of antenna pattern is this? Well, we just said it's the elevation pattern. John, is it just the uh, DB spacing that tells you the difference between elevation and azimuth patterns? Uh, no, it's not. You can have the same DB spacing. It's because this is a half circle because you can't transmit into the ground. Okay, gotcha. This, this flat bottom line tells you that that's parallel to the ground. And so this is elevation. This is degrees off the ground. You can't transmit, have a, a lobe of transmission power into the ground. It's just gonna be absorbed in the ground. So, so ideally you want your, your first main lobe of elevation pattern to be like between five and 10 degrees. Let's see if that's 15, that's this is like maybe eight degrees. Depends on how you're how you interpolate that. Um, so if it was lower down here at five, that would be even better. Uh, 10 to 15 degrees is getting too high for a takeoff angle. But but you want your your main lobe and elevation pattern to be between five and 10 degrees. And again, five would be down here at this angle. This one's not, there's, there's not much power at five degrees going out. It's all up here at eight or 10 degrees. So that's an elevation pattern. Go back to E91 and study the difference again. Now, the azimuth pattern is a full circle. You're looking down from the top. So you're looking at the top going forward out from the, the front direction of the Yagi antenna. This looks like a Yagi antenna pattern. What was, let's see, minus 18 dB for the front to back ratio would be good for maybe like a four or five element Yagi or six element Yagi. Sometimes if you're looking at Yagi antennas, you get the specifications for it. They'll give you the, the, the gain, the front forward main load gain and the front to back ratio. And sometimes they'll even give you the antenna patterns. This is the azimuth, which is azimuth full round the circle 360 degrees around your antenna, which is here at the center pointed towards zero. So that's the main lobe. Down here at the elevation pattern, it shows you how the, the lobes rise above ground. The flat line on the bottom means that's the ground level. So this is elevation coming up off the ground. And that's that's elevation. That's the type of pattern in E92. So, so just real quick on the um, front to back on that elevation pattern, you're saying that the back end is a ballpark on that second mm -hmm. line, which would make it a negative 30 dB. And the front's at about an eight degree offset there. So you're getting that negative, that 28 degree? No, no. The, the angle of the main lobe doesn't figure into the front to back ratio. The front to back ratio has to do with uh, amplitudes, the gain coming off the main lobe, okay. which is okay. zero, the outer That's circle. That's zero. Mm -hmm. DB and the back lobe, this last little lobe at the bottom Okay, I see. Just inside the, the 30 to 30, the negative 30 line then. So that's, that's where right. you're getting that. Okay, and okay, okay. 20. Like okay. the next circle out is minus 20. 
and then the one that's in toward the center is minus 30 and the the little lobe here at the bottom yeah. on the back side crosses the minus 30 line so that's where you get 28. Okay so it's basically the same as we did with the azimuth uh, overhead view you have to have zero on the front edge and the back edge was that negative uh, 15 or whatever it was. Was it 15, 18? Yeah, the, that, yeah, that ballpark yes. there, the back side. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. it's okay. the same okay. principle. It's just a different pattern and a different presentation. Okay, but it's, yeah, I gotcha, gotcha. See, right, this, thank you. this is the, the horizontal main lobe that's going along the ground. And yeah. so it's at zero and the back lobe is in azimuth at uh, minus 15. Yeah. 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 About halfway. Yeah. The, yeah. It's are, just, it's hard to see in that other, in the, the elevation view because it's just got all those little bubbles that's there. Right. So it's, it, yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. It has yeah. all the little bumps, but you have to notice that it crosses the minus 30 line. So it's mm. somewhere between minus 30 and minus 20. Uh, where was that? That was before the picture. Yeah. Here at 28. See that it's good that they don't give one of the choices as thirty because then you'd have right. to debate that. But yeah, it's yeah. not thirty-eight. What yeah, because I'm looking at a book, and a book looks like it's sitting on the the, the thirty line. That's why your your picture well, versus that's, what's that's a what small point in a book. Yeah, it's real hard to see in the, the small picture. It's real hard to see, and that's why I to well I copied this picture that's in my my word document from the official of VEC figures. There's a file I'll send in the, the notes email for today. The, um, the actual one's really small. The actual one is really small and it does look like minus 30. I do agree with that. Yeah, it's like I can barely yeah. see it. I mean, I get the magnifying glass out. I can barely see any blue yeah, breaking I, I that line. See it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> But what you'll uh, learn about the government standard testing is, is the closest answer to what you can see is going to be the correct one. Okay. That's good to know. Yes, that's good to know. That's yeah. It. yeah. Exactly. Approximation. Engineering rule. Yeah. Eh, close enough for, you know. That's right. Close enough for government work. You heard that. Right? Work. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it is an elevation pattern. Uh, let's see. So what is the elevation angle of peak response? in the antenna radiation pattern shown in E9T. What does that mean? What's the answer? Seven and a half degrees. Oh, that means what's the main lobe elevation? The elevation angle of peak response. Well, the peak response is the, the longest lobe that gets, to, gets the highest amplitude. See, this is at zero. This one's at, if this first circle inside is minus 10, That'd be like maybe minus three. The next one down is at minus five or minus six. This one that's going uh, at nearly 75 degrees is at minus uh, 14. So the biggest lobe of all these in the elevation pattern is the main lobe. And that they said that was seven and a half degrees. Uh, yeah, what's, what's the elevation angle of peak response? The answer is seven and a half degrees, and they're talking about the main lobe right here. So then that so, would apply to basically where your greatest signal is being propagated towards. Yes, correct? exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. okay. Okay. Right. I mean, it's not 25 or 45 or 75. So where are those angles on here? 25 degrees would be this one. Uh, 45 would be this lobe. 75 degrees would be this one, but I'd argue that that's 70, not 75 for the peak of this lobe. So those four lobes, the highest amplitude is the main lobe, which is the lowest down where you want it. And they're saying seven and a half degrees. Yes, that, that's your, your main propagation lobe. Now, would that be a good antenna because you're basically almost going horizontally flat on your propagation? Wouldn't you wanna have more of a vertical takeoff? Sorry. Hey, John. Yes. You want to like, you got four questions left before 10 minutes. All right, I'll, I'll hold until after four o'clock. Okay. Um, well, the quick answer to the, to this is if you want to transmit a long ways, transmit most of the power parallel to the earth. 
if you want to do an invis near vertical incident something i forget what the s stands for nvis is the acronym if you want to look it up that would be where you shoot most of your rf vertically so you talk to people closer to you near because vertical it, incident skywave that's it skywave yes thank you near vertical incident that's not on the test so we'll, we won't worry about that uh how many questions we got a few left this and one is you got oh, we're almost minutes. done. We've got 10 minutes. Okay, we're doing great. We are going to get to finish. Uh, thank you for asking questions. That clears things up in my mind, too. How does the radiation pattern of a horizontally polarized three-element beam vary with increasing height above ground? It wants to know about the radiation pattern of a three-element Yagi so you have to know how to read the question to, in order to answer it. Vary with increasing height above ground. The answer is B, the takeoff angle of the lowest elevation lobe decreases. So you, if you increase the height of your three element Yagi, then the lowest elevation lobe decreases. Well, this is part of the answer to your question. Uh, of why do you want the, the elevation load low to the ground? It's because the lower to the ground you get it, the farther it's going to propagate in distance around the world. If you shoot it up at a high angle, if you have the main lobe up here at 45 degrees, uh, it might just go right through the ionosphere and not reflect back. Uh, the, the best reflection, if you recall from the uh, the ionosphere uh, section that we studied is the, sh the shallowest angle you can get to bounce off the ionosphere makes for longest uh, path propagation. So that when it, the, the, this, this RF energy out of this main lobe goes and glances off the ionosphere, bounces back down to the earth, probably glances off the surface of the ocean, which is like a mirror to RF energy, bounces back up to the ionosphere, second hop comes back down uh, in Europe or Russia or Africa or makes another bounce and goes up into China somewhere. I mean, that's not uncommon to, uh, to bounce the radio waves two or three or four times around between the ionosphere and the earth. So if you're going for distance, get this main lobe down as low as you can get it. If you want to shoot all your energy straight up and have it bounce right straight back down, you're just going to talk to people around uh, 50 miles around you. And maybe that's all. Like if I want to talk around Texas, uh, I need to shoot the RF straight up so it bounces straight down. And so it doesn't go bouncing off toward Europe. I'm not, I'll, I'll skip right over Texas. So this should be something on the, some explanation here. And it might in the book, I didn't read the explanation in the book, which might go into this more. E9 yes, it's covered pretty good. Um, you might read that in the book. If, if the, it's still unclear when we get done with the rest of the questions, we can go into it more. But, but if you want the farthest propagation you can get out of your RS signal, the takeoff angle needs to be the lowest elevation it can. And you get that by increasing the height above the ground. So in, in moving the, 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 the uh, Yagi, the three element Yagi, up higher above the ground makes the takeoff angle, which means the angle of the main lobe, uh, lower to the ground. And we can talk about that more. Let's finish these before uh, everybody runs out of time. In case you have to leave, you got something planned because we promised to stop at four o'clock. Now this is an interesting setup. 
uh, one that I've contemplated. However, my wife did not want to move to be out on the side of a hill on, in Colorado somewhere. Um, I mean, this could be the Rocky Mountains. You're off here on the side of it. Uh, how does the performance of the horizontal polarized antenna, which is your three element Yagi, or four or five or seven, whatever you want to put up, mounted on the side of a hill compared to the same antenna on flat ground? And the answer is the main takeoff angle decreases in the downhill direction. So not only do you get your Yagi with a low angle takeoff angle and elevation, it moves the angle down, the angle of takeoff. You might even get it parallel to the, the ground for 30 miles around you, in which case that's probably the best you can do and not have it hit the ground over here 50 or 30 miles from you, assuming there's no mountains here on the other side. But if you live around Denver, between Denver and Colorado Springs, and you're on the I lost your audio. Okay, I think he wants me to get these last three questions. Is that correct, John? Yeah, we just got the two. I mean, he was explaining this one. We just need to answer on 14. Oh, okay, yeah, the downhill side. It's going to get better. Okay, all right. He's holding something right. up. I can't read it. <laughs> yeah, he told me go ahead and finish it. So on the next one, uh, what is the I, I, well, I can't even, isotopic antenna, okay? And so an isotopic. Mm, is no, that, no, D, D02, oh. when are your polarization of Yagi? He's scrolling up and down. I, I've got the wrong. I was on the wrong. There it is, right there. Uh, no, one more down, John. Yeah, that one here. Somehow I got to the wrong page. Oh, there we go. Okay. Echo nine. Uh, how can linear polarized Yagi antennas be used to produce a circular polarization? Um, so, um, if you produce them where they're perpendicular to each other, uh, this with the driven elements, one going 90 degrees out of phase with the other one, that is the correct answer. What that does is, is the lobes from each one of them will fill in the gap and make a circle that's going out in, in in space and I don't have a drawing to kind of explain that but um, you, you a lot of uh, military antennas they do this so that they can get real tight beams to shoot from one point to another and it kind of makes a cone going out is what it does does that make sense yes okay So the last question is, uh, how, how much does uh, gain of an I idea? I don't know what's happening. You back, John? Are you back? Are you back? Hello? Okay, well, all right. So we're gonna go to the last question. How much does the gain of an idea parabolic dish antenna change when the operating frequency is doubled? So what they're saying there is on a parabolic dish, that's like the little satellite antennas that they put on a everybody's house. That's what a parabolic dish is. And so as you double the frequency, you're, you're going up in frequency. Uh, you're going to uh, 
quadruple the gain. So instead of 3 dB, which would double it, you're going to go to 6 dB on a parabolic dish as you double the frequency. Does that make sense? Because you've made it a, a, a tinier frequency and the dish amplifies that gain for you. It's, it's kind of like a magnifying glass is what a parabolic dish does is probably the easiest way to explain it. It uh, allows you to uh, uh, focus and that's why they, they have such a minute little signal coming off of a satellite and you can pick it up at the back of your house with the parabolic dish. Is there any questions on that? So because like the focal me? point is getting tighter. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe you're going up and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, just like in a light. Yes, yeah, we got you, John. John. Do you see me? No. Hang on. Nope, your picture's gone, but your audio's back. What's going on? So it, yeah, it's 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 like a focusing the the point. So what it does is it captures, and it's mainly used only in uh, oh, satellite. We lost everything. Uh, we still hear your voice. Uh, it's like uh, don't know in your microwave frequencies is typically where it's. Let's used. try. And uh, it takes that energy, yeah. which is a very very tiny little wavelength. And it kind of scoops it all up across that and focuses it to the receive antenna that's sitting in front of it. And, and we, we call that a buck. But um, the, the, the energy is all focused in. And they used to use the same thing to make solar panels uh, to where they could focus them and have high intensity light hitting the panels. The problem was, is they were killing the elements, the, the cells, solar cells themselves, because they were also focusing the heat. They had to put huge heat sinks on the back of them. Does that help with that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So it's one of those memorization topics. <laughs> eh, it's just, it, it, if you play with antennas as much as me and John do, you'll, you, you'll understand this a little bit more. It's probably my favorite subject is antennas. I, I love antennas.